Got to make sure I can know how to use this thing. Not used to public speaking. So when, uh, when Rick said, Ron, would you, uh, I'd like to ask you to come to Bits in the Bay. I'm going to be there anyway. And uh, could you please give an introduction, some uh, fundamentals uh, before uh, Fred Huffman comes up and gives you a deep dive on MPLS and technology at the, at the grassroots level. And my first thought was, wow, I get to introduce Fred. That's one thing. And then the second thing was I remember this boss of mine once said, when you get in a group of experts like this here, you've got to make it as simple as possible, but don't make it any simpler than that. So even though this thing says fundamentals, I'm trying to boil it down so you have a quick introduction to what Fred's going to talk about in a deep dive. But this is based on experience spread over the last four or five years of working in this area. So it'll warn me if I'm going too deep. So we've all heard about IP. We're moving stuff to the cloud. We, we know we can do the whole workflow, like Sony says, in the cloud. And away we go. But fun, the fundamental elements of all of this is connectivity. If you don't have the connectivity right, then you're sort of not going to be able to implement all this stuff other than within your local area uh, network and within your facility. So what this talk is all about is the other thing that's happening. Prices are coming down significantly on IP terrestrial connectivity for all of those reasons of the big giant gift we're getting from the IT community. We're using it for broadcast. Now the prices are coming down to the point where these networks are competing and replacing uh, big elements of what we would call our legacy satellite world. And this is tough for me because I distributed, built hundreds of satellite broadcasting networks around the world, so it took a lot of convincing for me, and I hope to share some of that with you. So what I'm going to do is, the first half of this is really talking about some fundamentals, talking about introducing some of the terminology, so, and then the second half is going to be talking about applications, and I'm going to leave all the hard stuff to Fred in the second half of the, of the presentation. So I'm going to get you up to the bottom of this stuff. One of the most common issues you have when we talk about this with senior management in different organizations is, well, wait, why can't we do this over the internet? Why do you need MPLS? And the reason is you can do some broadcast application on the public internet, but the uh, public internet is an unmanaged network, as you all know. There are a number of people, like LTN, for example, well-known. Uh, some people here are probably using them. I know at PBS we are using them as well. The peop other people like VideoShip, and they make a business out of aggregating public internet capacity so that they can get point-to-point, point-to-multi-point distribution of broadcast quality content. It's working today. People like CNN, like Good Morning America, are bringing contribution feeds in. People are using them for backup uh, connectivity when their primary circuits go down. And they make a business out of it. Now, what these guys do is they basically take an appliance of some type, put it at your source, and other appliances at the other end, and then they manage uh, the aggregate capacity within the public internet in various ways, some are proprietary and some are otherwise. They'll take baseband SDI and encode it, or they'll take transport stream over IP in and, and put it over the network. And the secret basically is to manage the bandwidth, give you enough, bring it all back together at the other end. Um, yesterday, I think it was Henry uh, Quintana talked about aggregates versus bonding, and they had a big discussion on that. This is an aggregate approach. So, what does that really mean? What, how does that work? And the reason I'm going to do this is not so much to, it's not competing, it's just to contrast it with what we're going to about, talk about in a few minutes. So if I look at my origin source, and you've got your, my videos coming out of microsecond accuracy, frame accurate, I'm splicing and doing all my stuff. I've got that pretty rugged. But I'm going into a network that is unmanaged. The routing's unmanaged, the delays, the latencies are bumping back and forth, jitters all over the place. And like the sort of famous Greek philosopher said once, that if you give me a long enough lever, I can move the world. You give me a big enough buffer, and I can cure all of the sins that are inside that internet uh, network. And the reason you do that is you just put them back in order if you're clever and you know what you're doing, and you don't lose packets. And you build enough redundancy and forward error correction in that noisy network, you can do that. The price you pay, of course, is latency. And on both of these providers I listed there before, and there's others, typically you've seen performance in the range of 200 to 600 milliseconds. That's good enough for a lot of applications. Satellite, we've got 250 milliseconds of latency. This can go, but I've seen it go a lot higher, over a second. So that's a major issue here with this kind of a network. So in summary, what this is good for is if you're combining with nonlinear file delivery and you don't have a lot of points to deliver it to, it's small numbers, small networks, 10 or 20, or you're bringing contribution feeds in on an occasional use, this kind of technology can be very cost effective. 
However, when you really get down into it, you think, oh, internet, I got 100 megabits per second, I pay 100 bucks a month at home. They're not carrying gigabits per second of content or huge files over that network 24 seven. So you really have to be careful with the pricing. It's not as inexpensive as people think. But the real issue for this stuff is that there's no way of managing classes service in the internet. No internet service provider will give you the ability to manage your traffic, apply traffic engineering, so you have priority over others within their network. That's a fact. Secondly, the internet is not multicast enabled. So if I'm one point, I'm ingesting to 10 other points out here, and I got a 15 megabit per second video, if I could multicast, I'm only feeding in 15 megs and taking it out where I want. You can't. With this kind of a network, you have to unicast. So I really got 10 times 15 ingested. It's 150 megabits per second, and then 15 out at the other ones. So that's a little bit of an introduction of the other ways of doing it. And nothing negative is a place to use it. And just doing it to contrast it with what we're about to talk about next. So when you look at MTLS networks, what this is is a managed network, un unlike the unmanaged public internet. And it's inherently robust and secure in the sense that, like we're getting all the gifts from the IT world and all those spin-offs on the economy and the rest of it, then of uh, uh, what's coming out of the IT community, they've got hundreds of customers on here that are much more concerned about their traffic and their billings every month than our small amount of the broadcast world. So there is a, 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 the tier one providers who do this kind of stuff have very solid fiber cores Always a question about the last mile, the last loop loop, and you have to engineer around that. But essentially, this is a technology that's been around for about 10 years now and it's starting to come to a very good uh, state-of-the-art situation. Now, what you see here, a CE is a, a customer edge router and a PE is a provider edge router. You'll see those pop up in a few minutes. The only thing common with this and internet is both this and internet uses internet protocol. And the other thing is we get tremendous leverage from all the IT technologies that have been evolving. So why multi-protocol? It's a technology that has been developed for wide area networks that has multiple protocol, of which IP is only one. Fred's going to get into this a little later. He's one of the pioneers on video over uh, ATM and over frame relay networks. And he's made the transition to MPLS over the last years like the rest of us. And so this is a, a state-of-the-art technology replacing these, a, these uh, other systems that have been around for a long time. And there's a reason for it, which I'll be explaining in a couple minutes. And what we're talking about specifically here is internet protocol, such as layer three if you're going router to router. But we're also talking about virtual private networks, not a VPN on the internet that you would VPN in so you give your team access into the back door of your NOC. We're talking about a VPN on a shared infrastructure with a specific routing that's been allocated to you that may change a little bit from time to time, but it's fairly stable. Unlike the internet where you're not sure what the routing is, it's fairly stable routing through the, uh, to these kinds of infrastructures. So why, again, as I mentioned, state of the art, you go do your survey and you'll find out that this is the leading way of doing ethernet over wide area networks. And there's a wide range of topologies that are available. And the most interesting one that I'll be talking about today is mesh. If you today give a list of 50 locations in your broadcast network by zip code, within a week or two, any one of a number of these providers here will give you a cost and availability uh, uh, for every one of those locations and be very surprised in continental US if you're not able to hit almost every one of those. What you're going to find is they come back and they say, I hit this one, this one, this one, this one, I can give you 100 megabits per second up to. This one, this one a little more rural, I can only give you DS3. And so you look at that and you're going to say, wait a minute, what's that all about? And they're going to say, wait a minute, you've got 100 megabits per second. That means I've got fiber there. I can also give you one gigabit and sometimes even 10 gigabits per second into those facilities. So that's the state of, of what's happening right now. There's a land grab out there for all the IT reasons we heard about. But uh, because of that, we get the economies of scale and the connectivity going in all over the place. The good news is that there are multiple competitive uh, providers, there's a whole bunch of new entrants, there's established ones, this is a list of the top eight tier ones, and there's much more than this, who are able to do this kind of service, not only within the United States, but uh, outside the uh, continental US. I always hesitate to show this slide because for years selling satellite networks, I use this to sell against fiber. <laughs> 
everybody knows this chart, right? I mean, it's $150,000 a transponder, roughly. And if you've got multiple transponders, you multiply that by so much a month, and uh, so many months a year, and you've got your operating costs. And it doesn't matter whether they go to one site or a thousand sites, it's the same flat broadcast one-way push model. When you get into linear, if I got 10 sites at X dollars a month, then I go to 100, it's 10 times more. I mean, there's a little slope because of economies of scale, but not really significantly flat. You don't get a flat buy for 1,000 sites versus 10. Satellite will always have a role if we're in large networks. Uh, digital cinema network I worked on here in the States, 1,500 sites. You're running 100 megabits per second for 12 hours to deliver a, a file. You can't compete with that. And on the terrestrial side, there is a role for satellite and always will be. Models we've seen have been five years ago. That breakpoint was like 50 sites for a bro broadcast application. Today, that's closer to 150 to 200 sites is where the break even is. When you start adding to that, two-way connectivity, the ability to attach into cloud and move from CapEx to OpEx models, then all of a sudden the benefits again added on top of that. And so the break-even point will depend on the application. So again, why, v why uh, MPLS IPVPN? Probably the most important reason from a broadcast perspective of replacing satellite with a terrestrial network is the fact that we can do IP multicasting on this kind of a, of a network. The significance of that is I, I can put up 10, 15 uh, time zone variants in, in various versions of an HD uh, multicast, and not one megabit per second of that is consumed anywhere in the core background, backbone, unless somebody actually uh, joins that source and actually pulls the video out of the, from the, uh, the original source. So that's very bandwidth efficient. And that example I gave earlier with the aggregate, Instead of 10 times 15, I got uh, for 15 locations. I now have 10, 15 for the number of channels, and it's independent of how many is joining. So that's sort of similar to what's happening on satellite, but in fact, it's, uh, we're no longer limited by the core backbone so much as what a station can ingest from this core aggregate network. The other thing is because this is a managed network, you saw the routers there in a minute ago, there's already automatic redundancy and disaster recovery built into these types of systems, so you don't have to worry about that. So the other element besides IP multicasting is that these networks are designed so you can traffic engineer, you can apply basic traffic engineering um, methodologies to setting the priority of the traffic that you want to run on the network. So you can decide a priority, my linear is important, my file base is not, it can go slower, etc. So that's an important factor of being able to use this kind of technology. But the other ones, if you look at these kinds of specs, these are typical, if you do a, you do a web search, you go out there, you'll find this. Typical one-way latency on a network like this is 25 milliseconds. You heard Matthew a few minutes ago talk about file transfers. At that rate, even FTP, you're gonna have some delays. You go to any of the uh, file ac WAN acceleration technologies like uh, Signia, the Spera, uh, the file catalyst, they can run up into the hundreds of megabits per second on these kinds of networks. Unlike satellite where we have 250 milliseconds of latency and maybe 50 milliseconds of jitter, here we're living in 25 milliseconds one way latency, two to five milliseconds of jitter. And the bit error rate, as a joke we always give, is uh, one micro bit per fortnight. You can run months before you actually have a single video a packet dropout in, a, in this kind of a network, and I've seen that personally. Um, this is not like the system Sony just talked about, where you have to have microsecond uh, accuracy and timing when you're splicing in videos and the rest of it. This is a network technology to replace satellite overlay. I've already got it, I want to get out the other end, I want to make sure my latency is fixed, a little bit of variation, and I, this basically means I can run without forward air correction on that kind of a network. And the, main, the other advantage is that we got a variety of different topologies, including full mesh. I'm not going to go through these in detail. I put them in so you can look at them at your leisure later. You do a little web search, you'll find these on the net. This is one of the providers, Verizon. And you see here their product offering. They every way from just Ethernet over Wavelength down to Internet over MPLS to Ethernet over MPLS Core, etc. This next one. I like this one because they put that third column in from the left. It shows the topologies. And if you look at that, what it basically says you can have point-to-point -point links from one gig to 10 gig. This is uh, level three. Uh, you can have at the top end point-to-point -point high speed, at the bottom end 
fast ethernet up to 10 gigs of just raw internet, uh, public internet capacity on their backbone. They'll sell that to people who want internet capacity. But I want to draw your attention to these two right here, in the, this layer two and layer three. If you're a masochist, a geek, and you really want to play, go to layer two, worry about your MAC addresses, worry about the tags, and, and you can have an interesting technology that you really have locked down and you're controlling aggressively. If you want something you can plug and play and have up and running in a day or two, go for layer three. And that's the one that's been most recommended in any of the work I've done over the last few years. Simple to use, variety of simple protocols. The other thing to notice here is this thing called classes of service. The, this one's six, six, and the other one had four, I think. Come back. Here's another one. This is CenturyLink, one of the new and up-and-comings. You see the sort of the product offering that they have. I'll leave that for you later at your leisure. So let's now, that was all theory. Let's get a little bit more to media and entertainment. Let's get to broadcast. So imagine now for a moment you've contracted with one of those eight tier ones. You've got in this case uh, one, two, three, four, five, six stations you want to hook up over this network. You've got a contract, an SLA. It's good for a year. You're going to test. Um, by the way, you can have multiple service providers, and I think uh, Fred's going to talk a little bit later about peering points. All these guys share huge data centers and peering points across the United States, and connecting level three to CenturyLink or any of those guys is a fiber cable from one cage to the other and, and a contract agreement. You can do that, and I think you're going to talk a little bit about that, Fred, but for a moment, just assume you went with one to make it easy. So the first thing you notice, I've tied in here six stations. My customer, uh, my edge of router, is tying to the cloud edge router. They're, they're, I'll call it the cloud. I, I think uh, Matthew was saying, if you're more comfortable with pipes, I'll get there in a minute. But so now I've tied it. This is a layer three router to router. The network is the handling there. And you notice here, I don't have a network operation center. I don't have a broadcast center in this method. Any one of these can be. It's a full mesh. Any one of them can be the broadcast center, or they could be in a peer-to-peer -peer type of configuration. But don't worry, I'll bring back the broadcast center later. So when you look at this, first thing people say, well, my eyes are, I don't like all those routers in the middle. So it really helps mentally. And again, I'm never taking a risk of making this too simple. But you think about that layer three network in the middle, what it really allows you to do, and the solid lines on the, on the right is an Ethernet LAN. It basically makes the the station-to-station -station interaction is a layer three in the middle there. It's, it's an MPLS network that gets it back and forth, router to router. But by the time you get it on the LAN, it just looks like a, a big extended Ethernet local area network with maybe 5, 10, 15 milliseconds of latency between them and a little bit of jitter. So from a broadcast engineering perspective, how do you use that? So I use that as a mental thing because I know that if I know the IP address of a printer up here in, uh, in Bob's site in Vermont, in, uh, in WHRO, I can print out on his printer if he lets me. Of course, that brings up all kinds of cybersecurity issues, which is another discussion. But this is a locked private network, and you can lock it down. So let's go back and reopen this again. So you saw the Sony and a, and a couple of others, uh, that beautiful demo of what uh, Harmonic's doing between UK or Europe and, and here. And almost every media and entertainment application these days has got some linear content. Believe it or not, we're still putting live and, and uh, pre-recorded programs up on satellite and through networks. You have some more and more going to file-based workflow. And of course, we need some monitoring and control of this network at our equipment level, not at the, not at the core level. And I'm going to simplify this. This is a, a virtual LAN here, just so I don't have to draw a box. I'll bring the box back later. So I connect another site like this. Now I have the ability of passing linear back and forth. I'm going to put the other four in here. Now, what I'm assuming here is any one of these guys asynchronously can set up a linear event, a multicast, preferably you can also use unicast here, wants to transfer files back and forth, and some monitoring control over the whole rover network. How do you manage that? Well, the secret to that is class of service. So what is class of service? Everybody says, well, what about quality of service? I'm worried about quality of service, quality of experience. And the answer to that is class of service is a tool, a traffic engineering tool, to give you quality of service. So you got a network. you got it all nicely put there. you got linear video going along beautiful on this land. It's on a one-gig circuit. 
and uh, you're doing 250 megabit per second videos. You're watching us perfectly, and then you put a file transfer on that consumes all of the bandwidth for the 15 seconds of transferring your video goes all to heck because you didn't differentiate the traffic. So this is a technology to do it. In the old days, it was called TOS, type of service. It's been replaced. Now that's a three-bit uh, uh, marking scheme. That's been replaced with a six-bit, so you actually have 64 levels of class of service. Every piece of traffic I put in to the network can be tagged, and the network is supposed to balance it and put the highest priorities through over the lower priority and dynamically adjust it as you go. So here we are. Let's go back into this little diagram we have. My linear, I absolutely don't want my Fox News, my, my, t my football game, the concert. It's got to get through no matter what. It's linear, highest priority. I don't care if a file takes an extra 10 seconds to deliver because typically I'm delivering files in advance of playout anyway. So it takes 10 or 15 seconds or I'm running extra high uh, video, linear video, to the network for say an hour because of a special event. They get slowed down for half their data rate for a, an hour. Then they, they'll take a little 15 minutes or whatever it is. Half it will be double another hour. I can afford to let that go. And I do need to have high level monitoring control. And by the way, monitoring control in this context is not monitoring control of the network. It is monitoring control of all the devices. It's SNMP type of monitoring control. What's failed? Temperatures over on this one. CPU is running hot or intrusion detections of a cybersecurity alert kind. So the way this works on all these MPLS networks, this is an example for one specific vendor. Every one of them requires you to take whatever you've segregated on your VLAN so you don't interfere with each other, different types of traffic. Before you put it into the network, you have to tag it, high, medium, and low. And the different projects I've been working on, the maximum I've ever needed is six, but you can get away with three. And three is pretty good for the types of work that we're doing. You get a little finer tuning in between, you can do that. So you have the choice. Do I tag it at this device and put that little six-bit tag in there? Or I can tag it at the router going into the network based on the kinds of traffic. Well, that's IP multicast. It must be highest priority. I'll tag it at DSCP or uh, 36 or 41, whatever it is, to the high end. Oh, this is a uh, best effort on the file transfer, just default zero, let it go, and it'll fill up the pipe. So what happens then is the class of service, you bought 100 megs or a gig here, checks to make sure you haven't exceeded the, the bandwidth you've paid for, and then within the, the network, adjusts it according to uh, what you have set. And at the other end, it comes out, hey, you only paid for 100 megs out here, anything over that gets dropped. But it really doesn't normally check or do any policing on the class of service here, but they will deliver them with the high, medium, and low on the other side as you've, de as you've designed the, the network. By the way, the VLAN is for segregation in your network. The class of service only applies inside uh, the MPLS network. And the beauty of this, it's full mesh, is it works the other way. So all of a sudden, I've got traffic going both directions. If I've set up the class of service properly, it auto-calibrates, auto-adjusts. I can have three videos going out here and coming out a couple places, one video coming back this way, files being transferred, it's all looked after here. And a typical, on all of these, by the way, they're full duplex. So if I bought 100 megabits per second here and all these sites, I've actually got 100 in, 100 out, and in this case, six sites, I've actually got six times 200, I've got 1.2 gigabits per second of core aggregate capacity. And there's various ways of paying for that. There's a bucket of bits, or I pay for a flat rate, usage rate, etc. If you've got 100 sites, all of a sudden you've got 20 gigabits per second. That's a lot of capacity in how you design your network and how you use it. Okay, so let's go from theoretical to now some real practical examples. A lot of people are familiar with this kind of a chain. It's a legacy satellite network. People are moving from pure linear playout more and more to near line delivery over the internet or through lease line or through MPLS networks. Let's just look quickly at how this works. So I've got production, they're working with scheduling traffic, scheduling automation to play out. You've got file based playout and you've got live events and it goes up on a DVB satellite broadcast, push technology. Whoops. At the other end I've got of course satellite IRD, lots of people make those and well established technology. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the satellite out of there and 
If you know, the first time I did this, there was an ooh and an ah in the room. No, 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 don't worry, I'll bring it back later. To, to make this exact network work, exactly, you call the, you can finally get your tier one, it's got you set up, and you got one site going. First thing you do is you read your SLA, and it says uh, 90 days to install, typically up to 60 to 90 days. Then you read it a little closer, you call them eventually and say, well, that's 60 business days. That's your first surprise. <laughs> anyway, so all you really need, you take the exact same transport stream over IP or ASI fee that you were putting up on your modulator, on your DVB transmitter, on your satellite, the exact same one, put it through a cherry picker. The reason I do that is if I've got 70, 100 megabits per second of linear feeds, I don't want to force somebody over here to take 70 or 100 megabits per second of linear feeds. I just want to take the ones that they are interested in. So you do that, and these are one RU high. Lots of people make them. Francisco, Ericsson, Sencor, a bunch of people. So I've got that feed. I put it into a VLAN, so I segregate it from the other traffic I'm going to add here in a minute. And I tag it here at the, my router that's going into that network. So that's all I have to do. At the far end, I'll come back to that later. It comes out. This IRD here now is, this, is an IP IRD. It does a multicast join to this device to get the channel it wants that's been cherry picked. File transfer, uh, like Matthew said, you don't want to do FTP on these networks. It slows it down further away, the slower it takes. But if you go with something like, uh, like we said, Signiant or uh, Spera or the File Catalyst guys, you literally get the nonlinear file transfers going on in the background uh, at, at whatever the available bandwidth is left. And if you've done the class of service correctly, it will take it. If you have 100 megs here and 100 megs there, and um, you've got three videos at 45 megabits per second, this will take every megabit per second minus a little overhead out of it. Let's say it's 50 megs. It'll transfer it away. Then you stop, that, stop joining that show because it's over. You've suddenly added up, now it's gone up to 65 megs because you've got more capacity. Up again, and then when you start putting more video, so that's how the class of service works on this in an automated way. Monitor control, as I mentioned, you put that on there because this is that's an MP type monitor control. If suddenly something dies over here uh, from a hardware perspective, then you can be able to pick that up pretty carefully. And this is, again, a TCP type thing. It's low data rate. It's fairly easy over an IP network. Okay, so where am I here? So we went back to, here's an example. This, tra this uh, traffic we want to tag is high, medium, and then low. Why medium here? Because I want to be able to trump anything. I want to know that something's failing. I can afford a little jitter here. And I can wait a little bit if I'm worried about a CPU starting to fail. Uh, one second ain't going to make a difference if I'm in that kind of a rush. Okay, so on the station side, this is what's happening. You notice I snuck in here a multicast video coming back. Because remember, this is fully symmetric. I am now have the ability of a station to be, who is normally receiving only, to be able to contribute to the, to the system. So what's happening here is coming back, the station would then again have to tag, make sure it's tagged high, medium, and low. Now the network should automatically adapt to that. Now, one last one. What are we going to do here? Just to walk through this again. So that IP, IRD there is the only station that's particular subscribing and does a multicast join to this particular broadcast center, live or linear event that right now. Nobody else is doing it. It's coming in, and these are the kinds of data rates we would normally use with H.264. By the way, running 4K on this, not a problem. You're running them at 25 megabits per second. If nobody takes it, it doesn't consume any of their input bandwidth, but it's there if they want it. I can have 15 different time zones if there are that many in the world, and you can pull them out as you like, uh, depending on what you want, and it doesn't consume any extra bandwidth at that end. Let's look at the file transfers. So if I had 100 megs here, and I'm running three HDs that are being pulled out by various people, and this, this station now says I'm consuming all 45 of that, well, that five gigabyte half hour show it rates a mezzanine about, say, 25 megabits per second or something, is only going to have half the bandwidth. It's going to take 13 minutes. When the video's over, when the li linear program's over, it goes back up to 100 megabits. That's six, six minutes to transfer it. And if this customer, this site actually pays a little bit more, they can get it a lot faster. All right, almost wrapping up here. So remember this is full duplex mesh. 
In this case, I've got two stations up there joining the multicast from this stage, this source on the right, and it's happening at the, at the same time the other one is going on. And uh, so that's the full mesh, full capability. Now, one of the interesting things, I'm going to start putting it back together again, and I'll bring the satellite back in a second. Here's my primary broadcast center in this particular example. That's an affiliate or a member station on the far side, and that's how it normally works. Everybody in this room who builds good broadcast networks know we do with redundancy and diversity. You notice how easy it was to have a diversity site here, a backup site, just with one more node on the network. The primary site and the backup are just one more node on this large network. Put in a separate geodiverse, maybe it's another, uh, another vendor, uh, specifically so you don't have to worry about an event. I, catastrophe happens, I lose this primary. This one takes over immediately. You can also use it for load balancing. And then you put the last of the stations in. Everybody says, well, wait a minute. What if I get a backhoe fade here? That's the biggest issue most people are worried about. If I have an outage on the last mile, you have the ability of paying double or 50% more, depending on your pricing model, of putting another line in. You can do that. Often that second link is in the same trench, so you're not as secure as you thought you were. So why do we get around that? So remember going back to this mental image, it's scalable, I can have multiples of these, multiple stations. And so one last comment before I wrap up with the satellite, I promise to bring you back. So when you have this network running, it's layer three, it's all IP, I got multicast on it, I got this huge backbone capacity. It's extremely easy because all these vendors have peering points with all the private and public cloud service providers that are out there in the world. So it's very easy to get a direct contact connection into those cloud service providers. And I'm not saying just the obvious ones like Amazon and Rackspace and, and Savas, for example. But I'm talking about anybody offering a cloud-based service that has actually got the right to attach into this network. All of a sudden, you have a secure method of attaching. If you're into a hybrid cloud, public internet is easy connected that way. Why would I possibly want to have all my stations talk to the public internet through that backbone? The reason for it is I have one IPsec concentration point there. Anybody coming in from the public internet having access to all this, I have one great location for cybersecurity protection and intrusion detection type systems, and I can do it in one place. So that's another advantage of this kind of a, a network from a broadcast perspective. I promise to bring the satellite back. This is an actual practical example. Two knocks, a primary and a secondary. Satellite is in there, so it's a fail soft backup. Most of the, most of the activity is file based and play out. A typical outage, or for a maintenance outage, an unexpected one might be half an hour. A routine one would be three to four hours. You may go several days if you really have a ditch witch pull up a fiber and you've got to run in something emergency wise. So that's why you have the backup in there to cover you for the, not having to have the double expense of a, uh, of a second fiber line. If it becomes critical for a site, you pay the expense and away you go. So you notice here the main ones, the main sites all got one to 10 gigs. That's okay, I've only got three or four. I've got hundreds of stations give them 100 megs and the system like this will work, or 200 if they want it for other, other things. So what's hybrid cloud? Well, as I mentioned, you always have trouble and talking up to people, what is the cloud all about? Uh, Matthew said you like pipes instead of, uh, instead of clouds. I always hesitate to put the cloud around the MPLS uh, route, router configuration, but I thought that was kind of appropriate. So I'm on time, Rick, hopefully, and uh, I'll lead you up to Fred. And we're going to have questions later, right? Okay. Thanks a lot for your attention, everybody. I got a, a quick housekeeping note um, as Fred gets wired up. Uh, the lunch is uh, still planned for 1.15, actually uh, 15 minutes later than I think it is on the printed schedule. But we're planning to do some Q&A during lunch so you guys can sort of queue up uh, at your leisure and even dine in here if, if it is relevant or just follow the presentation. That's why we'll get to uh, Mark Cuban on time as well. Uh, Fred, is, uh, as Ron had mentioned, 
is going to delve down a little deeper. I don't know that we'll have a, enough time for you guys to get as deep as Fred's capable of going. I mean, he, he could take a deep diving suit, you know, down to the trench in the bottom of the Pacific uh, on the MPLS subject. But I uh, just wanted to do a uh, endorsement of uh, his book. I had reviewed it uh, on Amazon, and I, I uh, really feel that along with uh, Carl Paulson's uh, two books, uh, also I highly recommend if you guys just look them up on Amazon. They're well worth it. And I know it's, I could tell those books are all labors of love, and, and uh, the authors uh, are giving you a gift if you uh, do read it. Uh, even though uh, Carl Paulson's original uh, book I mentioned the other day on uh, video media servers is 15 years old, is still a viable, you know, worthwhile bookshelf uh, reading, but his uh, 2011 uh, Moving Media Storage uh, book is a great one. And I'm leading into uh, introducing Fred as the author of uh, Practical IP uh, and Telecom for Broadcast. So I strongly urge you to read that because if you're not going to have enough time for Fred, then take some of the pressure off of Fred because he could just say, well, go to this chapter or whatever. Read it. It's in my book. So Fred, without any further ado, let me, sorry, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get your, um, your slide up. I apologize. This is you. <clears throat> All right. That looks like mine. It is. Thank you, Rick. There you go. It's a very good, great pleasure for me to be here to talk to a group like this. And I specifically want to uh, say, say how, how much I appreciate Rick's method about getting me here. As I get a LinkedIn mail from him one day, it says, I have your book on my desk for 10 years, and it's dog-eared. Would you come talk to us at uh, Bits by the Bay? And I said, on what? <laughs> anyway, we, he wound up, and this is a second thing I appreciate uh, very much, is Rick T put me in the traces with Ron. And over the last couple of days, I've had opportunity to talk to him in some detail and uh, be become very uh, much an admirer of what he does and how he goes about doing it. So uh, with that, let me just say a little bit about myself, which is uh, for the last three or four years, I've been involved in trying to watch the evolution and deployment of Metro Ethernet service, <clears throat> excuse me, which I'm going to talk about in some level of detail. But over the last uh, many years, I've spent uh, my first, first part of my career at RCA in uh, either in Camden or out in the field. So I've had my feet in both sides of the bro uh, broadcast industry and the communications networking world for more than 50 years now. And if you can believe something like that, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to find uh, projects that I really like to do that make me a little money to pay the mortgage. So here we are at Bits by the Bay, and again, I'm on a similar track as Ron with fundamentals, and it's kind of my job now to begin to explore some of the lower level detail in how to go about piecing these kinds of networks together. The book, as he mentioned, was really the catalyst for getting me here. Uh, the book was published in 2004. That was at a point where I had been uh, offered a job to go to Greece. I spent two and a half years in Greece and Italy with the 2004 Athens Olympics and 2006 Winter Games, mostly dealing with uh, design validation testing. And I also wrote and delivered the training material for uh, the operations people for the uh, both uh, Olympic Games. Uh, Ken, it's available on Kindle. The publisher I talked to the publisher a couple, oh, three four months ago, and was really surprised that the book is still selling a few copies a month, and also the Kindle version is is starting to sell now. So I'm not sure what it is. But my approach to this uh, presentation is very similar to the approach I took in the book, which is practical. I was talking to my friend Mike Payton at uh, CBS News a week or two ago about this, and we were talking about who's the audience. And there's some 
way of looking at an audience or a potential audience, on the one hand, you've got all of the experts who deal with design and planning or whatever at a higher level. And then on the other uh, side of the spectrum, if you, you've got guys that don't mind getting their hands dirty. In fact, that's the way I learned. I had a math teacher one time that um, believed in the power of uh, uh, learning through the elbow, and he gave a lot of homework. So uh, a, a little bit of a fine print here to the extent that this is basically my views and, and my work, but it's not intended to be any kind of a recommendation or a uh, due not intended to substitute for due diligence. And, and that's not only my view of it, but it's Simpty's view of it. If you really want somebody to help you with a due diligence exercise, then I'm, I'm certainly willing to do that. How many people have heard of Internet of Things? Pretty popular uh, subject in the last couple years as uh, people tended to listen to John Chambers and a lot of the other people that do a lot of uh, talking about the Internet. But it's really been around for a lot of years. This is my friend, Bent Cerf. Bent and I worked together at MCI for several years. And he's usually a very well organized, a natty dresser, good sense of humor. But he uh, been always, wore, always wears a vest underneath a, a suit jacket. He showed up at an IETF meeting in the mid 90s, pulled off his coat and then opened up his shirt. And underneath there, it says, I pee on everything. So now we're finally at a state where we're getting IP everywhere, or as they call it, Internet of Things. Now down to the, the subject at hand. And I want to start with, again, this is my view of a high level description or a model for the, uh, the process we're all involved in day to day to day, which um, involves a combination of the point where con is, content is created and then distributed and then delivered at, at an end point. Back in the mid-90s when Paul Donaldson and I came up with this uh, sketch, this model um, was in the relatively early days of video over ATM, which evolved into video over IP. And this model, um, can also be, t be detected, uh, be depicted in um, a, a, a fairly real world implementation, but the point of both of them simply has to do with the, the concept that I call content transport. You're, you're constantly moving content back and forth between uh, various points where it's monetized, as the financial people like to say. If we look closely at what we're doing now and what we've been doing for the past oh, 15 years, 10, 15 years at least, most of the facilities that other people have described have a, a, a uh, way of moving content that involves uh, the internet, ethernet, and so forth, in other words, non-real-time, or the traditional SDI approach to uh, linear, as it's called, or real-time content. So we have these parallel models that we're running. Um, Hugo made a, a good point of uh, reinforcing all of this multiple times. The other thing that we're seeing more recently is this thing called cloud computing. And uh, when you really think about it, there's uh, situations you can get into with that, like Matthew talked about is the non-real-time or file-based file workflow, so-called. But there was an announcement a couple weeks ago by uh, ABC that they're running a master control operation out of the cloud. And to me, that means they're taking video out of a, playing out out of a server pool somewhere, and it's getting eventually to the point where it's distributed out of a master control to transmitters and whatever uh, delivery distribution platform something like that goes to. The problem I have with what I've seen so far as the way 
these cloud services are uh, presented, promoted, sold, and so forth, has to do with a simple lack of recognition or information that's available on what I call cloud computing communications links. It's basically the link between the, the workstation and the data center that's hosting the cloud. And you've got three potential connections there. One is the local network where all this material comes from. And then you've got the connection between that and the data center network. And at the data center network, um, this data center network connects to all of the servers and other compute uh, resources in the data center. But even the NIST standards that describe cloud computing barely refer to or they really don't make clear who does what. But you've got this cloud capability that really comes from two different sources. And usually what happens is one will uh, enter into an agreement or an agency agreement, selling agreement with the other. The phone company sells the cloud, the cloud sells the phone company. And there's even some cases today with, where data centers are selling cross-connect services from one customer to another customer or from one customer's uh, premises or location to another of their locations. They cross-connect in the data center and bypass the phone company on that they would normally have to go through to get to uh, the other location that they want to get to. And the, the main point in all of this has to do with a recognition of the simple fact that an end-to-end -end application performance in terms of response times can never ever be better than the communications link response time. It's the kind of thing Matthew was talking about so far as um, the uh, movement of these files using uh, WAN acceleration. And that was, whoever made that explanation about WAN acceleration was a very good way to do it, by the way. My advice when you're dealing with something like this is twofold. One, be diligent, understand the architecture and the implementation details down to the lowest level, and then be very detailed. Be diligent and be detailed. One of the tools that's out there for carrying out this kind of validation stuff is a ITU recommendation 1564, which uh, they call service activation methodology. You, you don't see too much reference to that in a lot of the uh, inf service information, product information. You can find a lot of it in a lot of the hardware manufacturers that make uh, network interface devices. I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. I think the next thing that makes sense to do is to start to define some models that we can use as reference points. Uh, basically, what we have here is this SMPTE 2022-6, which is, uh, Hugo had described it as being something that transports uh, uncompressed HD, which is true. In the typical um, 2022 high bit rate media uh, transport has uh, information and approaches to dealing with uh, uh, media transport through an IP network. So you have a, a remote venue on one end, a production facility on the other. This is the basic model that's going to grow up, I think, over time as Hugo's uh, live production uh, capability starts to mature and, and become more widely used. The key parts of worrying about this sort of thing is if you when, when you involve um, a, a communications provider in this kind of business, the things you've got to be concerned about are the, the service demarcation points. You know, this is uh, the media side of this thing. And then on the other side, you've got the, 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 the venue on one side, the customer premises on the other. And there's some level of overlap here to the extent that Typically, the service provider puts a piece of equipment on your premises, either at the venue or at the production center, which they own and control, and then you interface with that. So carving up these multi-megabit pipes that have been talked about, 
becomes a real, can become a real circus. And I'll talk more about uh, service, agree service level agreements in a minute. But basically what uh, SIMPTE 2022, 2022 does is to, and this is right out of the standards uh, text itself, defines a method for encapsulation of pay payloads over a variety of existing serial digital video standards that don't include 4K, by the way. It covers a single path transport with network switching or what Hugo would call dirty switching, which is it's uncoordinated, unsynchronized, and is typically the kind of thing you hear characterized as 50, 50 millisecond uh, uh, switchover or backup switching inside the network. SIMPTE 2022-7, uh, Hugo mentioned, describes clean switching, or the ability for equipping the network so that it can do A, B, or backup uh, switching. It all, there's also a version of this that he mentioned with forward error correction. My own view of this at this point in its maturity is it's in what I think is a dire need of some practical engineering guides and recommended practices uh, that we normally see in uh, SIMPTE standards. And I think this is one area, earlier there was a, a plea by um, Carl, I think it was Carl Kuhn, I think it was for more participation by users in standards development. And this is an area where uh, people that are actively involved in this day to day can really make a contribution. A couple of in other important pieces of text that um, have to do with uh, what SIMPTE uh, says is about uh, network, network capacity. It says, in order for a system supporting this standard to function correctly, the bandwidth available in the network shall always meet or exceed that required by the IP stream generated by the system. It's in, it's in the note, it's important to ensure that the network path is designed with adequate bandwidth and a low enough error rate such that equipment can successfully decode the stream. And then talks about the um, options as far as forward error correction is concerned. Now, I think it uh, probably makes sense to walk through one of the things I didn't understand completely for a long time, and I, I think I understand it much better now, is how do you get an SDI stream into a bunch of packets and get it across the network and then take it out again? Basically, life on this process starts with a real-time uh, serial digital stream, either 270 megabits or, or gigabit and a half. The first step in this process is to parse the stream into 1,376 byte chunks. Keep in mind that when this parsing happens, you have something that is in an IP packet. That packet is a static entity. It has no relationship to any kind of timing or anything like that. It gets sent across the network, and then it's put back into a real-time uh, serial digital stream. Second step is it takes these entities, these packets, static entities, and serial numbers them, and then uses this real-time protocol to transport it acro across the network. Next step is attach it to a UDP header, and then the UDP header gets moved into um, the, the IP layer, layer three. After that, it, this entire combination of the content bytes plus the overhead, as it's called for these things, gets stuffed into the payload section of a layer two or ethernet frame. This ethernet frame makes a connection, layer two ethernet transport stream, makes a connection to SONIC SDH or physical layer one. And at this point, we have a situation where all of a sudden ethernet framing is, is replaced by the underlying either SONIC SDH or it could be some other type, just uh, dark fiber with ethernet physical layer uh, protocols. 
And there are a lot of different ways of uh, you hear people talk about this stuff, but in the basic lingo, it's SDI over IP over Ethernet over packet, uh, sonnet, or SDH. You'll also hear them talk about SDI or IP packet sonnet SDH. And then the last thing is you'll hear packet over sonnet, which means it's the packets get put directly into a, a sonnet frame or SDH frame and get transported across the network. Now, what MPLS is? This is my simple way of trying to explain it because this is the way I understand it. Take an end-to-end -end connection and what happens or what, I say what MPLS is, multi-protocol label switching, a technique whereby an IP network equipped with MPLS enabled routers, that's very key, routes packets along a predetermined path to their destination based on information in the label instead of the source and destination address that you normally use in uh, best efforts Ethernet uh, routing. Now, uh, Mike, or I'm sorry, uh, Ron used the term uh, tag. Tag is the same thing as a label. And let's talk a little bit about how that label comes about and, and then gets used. Uh, you saw in Ron's stuff where he talked about a customer edge router. I'm not sure he mentioned, but just inside the network, yeah, I think he did, he mentioned a label edge router. These two, between these two pieces of equipment, or two systems, they, they make a label that is a proxy for the IP address and the class of service marking that he talked about, the customer's location, where that is. There's a, a, a plethora of information that can go into that label. And then that label that's eventually created here or forwarded out of this router across the network to the next hop, which is, a, is called a label switch router, which has the ability to look at what comes in and take the label and then forward that to the next one. And at the end of this process, this takes the label off, or you hear people say the label is popped off the stack and then it gets sent over to the, the customer edge device where it's decoded and presented as a normal IP stream. So this is just points I wanted to make. The customer edge device basically creates packets. This can be this can be your VLAN or it could be the network interface device if it's equipped to, to create MPLS labels. The customer edge device creates the packets with a class of service marking and puts them into Ethernet frames. Then it's a transparent path across the layer two infrastructure to the label edge router. The other thing the label edge router does that's key to this process is it is, uh, knows about the entire rest of the network where all the other MPLS capable or MPLS enabled routers um, are and it creates a path through the network or sets up uh, a virtual private line through the network that then every uh, router that's MPLS capable uh, can, can use to, to forward the label switch packets. Let's see, where am I here? I, mean, I think we covered most of that. Now, let me back up a little bit and kind of give you my two cents worth on what I see this whole IP transition is about. First thing is the IP production uh, facility requirements. Uh, if I were in uh, planner designer shoes working on a project that envisions conversion from SDI to IP, the, f the first thing that we need to ensure is not to allow this new technology to, to change uh, operational practices un unless we know they're going to be to our uh, benefit. The second most important thing to me would be to parse the existing workflow and really understand where uh, a lot of people use the term work silos where there's approval cycles in the interruption of uh, uh, content flow and production. 
where it goes for some kind of approval or sometime, some kind of quality testing or something like that. So we need to understand where these points are that we can make deliberate, conscious decisions about how to change the workflow that will benefit us the way we want. This stuff should be standards-based, and it's not just SMPTE. There are a lot of related standards in IEEE, IETF, and ITU that uh, you can leverage to do a better job of what you're doing. Then, of course, it's all of this stuff about making sure we use uh, commercial off-the-shelf switch and router equipment, and uh, kind of the new player in this whole market space in the last few years are Metro Ethernet uh, virtual services, and that's, I'm going to talk about that in, in some detail. The other thing I want to mention here is, um, I don't know if you've heard the term before, but there's a term that's called hypervisor-based data center operations. This really came out of a lot of work that Facebook and uh, Amazon and others have done to be able to do more with less by um, getting involved with server manufacturers and chip manufacturers to produce smaller, more uh, powerful, and less um, power-intensive uh, servers and hardwares and network equipment. John Myatt talked a little bit about uh, this area some when he talked about the open flow stuff. <clears throat> the last thing that I would want to be sure I had access to was some way to do uh, trial or lab evaluations of this stuff. It, it's, there just is not much value in doing due diligence on paper, yet yeah, that's really more, more of a plan. But the rubber really meets the road when you get the stuff in your shop or in your lab or whatever and hook it up the way you want to use it and then make sure that it meets at least the hardware manufacturer's uh, specifications. And if you have more stringent uh, specifications as part of your procurement process, then you want to make sure it deals with that. And I guess the last thing that I wouldn't want to forget is that the production facility technical requirements really drive picture quality and sound fidelity. There, there's just no other way to say it for me. And if, if we don't satisfy the viewers and the ad agencies and sources of revenue, then you know, we, don't, we don't do uh, enough to keep our jobs. Along the way in this whole process, rather than try to put uh, dates and milestones on things or dates that things are going to happen, I like to think of something like this as uh, seeing things um, emerge and come out along the way. And I think one of the first things we're starting to see now that over the next year or so you're going to see much more of is the type of thing Hugo talked about where you take the cameras to the venue you don't have a big truck, you have connections back to uh, uh, maybe an idle production facility that then does this production. There's a, a lot of this going on now. The uh, Simpty Journal that um, Hugo mentioned earlier has a big article in it um, by CBC that virtualized a lot of their Socio Olympics uh, coverage. Hugo also talked about um, this idea of hardware, software, systems, production switchers that can do mix effects and uh, the normal things we do in, with, in an SDI environment. And almost more importantly is the appearance of SMPTE 2059, which is this new way of uh, synchronization and time labeling that's come out in the uh, last few months or so. Very critical. Another area that has been kind of alluded to, and somebody asked a question earlier, is what I call a television-friendly protocol analyzer and some form of intelligent automated monitoring tools. And uh, I was talking to a guy in New York, it's been a, some time ago, about this very subject, and he went on with his thoughts, and he ended his comments. He says, and despite what the IT people believe, ping and trace route won't cut it. So there's got to be new stuff in the pipeline. 
the last, th well, not the last thing, but certainly one of the things that you'll see soon, and I think Hugo alluded to it, if he didn't say it directly, is I think it, we're going to start to see 10 gig e um, interfaces on cameras and other um, essence sources that are virtualized and have the ability to carry the things that Ron talked about in a way of monitoring and control, but also extending this control out to, uh, if you've got cameras in a remote venue, control the camera, just like you would if you were sitting in a mobile unit that the camera was um, part of. And the last thing that I think we'll see, and somebody may have mentioned this, or maybe it was part of Hugo's, is a lot of these hybrid signal conversion boxes or gateways, as they're euphemistically called now, between IP and SDI and SDI and IP will ultimately disappear. And you'll have the so-called all, all IP live production facility at that point. Just my two cents worth for it, but uh, that's how I think I'm going to see it roll out. Now to some of the... Um, thoughts and models that have to do with content transport links. My first consideration would be, how in the heck do I keep my job, get my work done, and uh, stay employed for some period of time? In other words, be successful. The thing that we're going to use to try to play this whole thing out is the legacy TV1 link model. How many people are use or know what a TV1 link is? Yeah, one of the first things Rick and I talked about in our early con phone conversation, he says, I've actually had uh, uh, telecom people, IT people, say they don't know what a TV1 link is. You know, so using a model like this, if you're familiar with it, you then can uh, play this out into the next generation uh, links. Basically, these TV1 link models have been around for several years. The first versions of it had um, analog uh, video and audio interfaces, and a typical use was a studio to transmitter link, just a one-way link that uh, carried the content from master control out to the studio. Then there was a next generation that came along, and the first implementation that I remember seeing on this used... Uh, DS3 uh, transport between the master control and either some intermediate point or another point on an intra-LATA basis. If it had to go across a LATA boundary, then you had to connect it to a, a uh, inter-LATA service provider. So <clears throat> from from here on, I want to uh, spend time with some of these reference models and then introduce you to uh, the Metro Ethernet world that's come out over the last few years. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the economics of these stuff, uh, this stuff as well as the technical characteristics. But before we dig in too deep, let's talk a little bit about what I see as the evolving world in the really telephone company or broader, more broadly across any type of network service provider. Carrier Ethernet is today available in hundreds of markets across the United States and is growing rapidly everywhere. You can get it um, in other cities around the globe. One of the things that's happened over the course of the last few years is tariffs and regulations Pricing, base pricing has all but disappeared. And what we have today is a set of commercial terms and conditions that are much, uh, very much constructed in favor of the service provider. Sometimes you can get something in the way of a service level agreement, but again, that tends to be rather one-sided. When it comes to the point of where you really want to try to procure service or design and build a network, the carrier's uh, sales forces and customer service functions have really been reduced and pared down to the point to where it is difficult to communicate with them today. It's a world of uh, a combination of what carrier service people are available to deal with you 
along with a whole bunch of resellers, wholesalers, third-party organizations, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's a really bizarre bazaar out there, if I could uh, use that kind of a term. The other thing we're definitely seeing is the automated order entry, and in some cases, provisioning process that the carriers are put in place today. Uh, if you've uh, moved a, a business or uh, changed your residence and had to order telephone service, uh, or you wanted to order a landline for phone service today, you know it always starts with a trip to the website and fill out their form, quote unquote. Oh, now, first model of this TV1 loop, broadcast quality TV1 loop. This is, mm, excuse me, is exactly what it's called by some of the service providers. This is the thing that years ago was uh, started, as I mentioned, and used in um, studio transmitter links. And you basically have a transmit box on one end connected through a dark fiber to a receive box on the other end. And what you put in on this end, you get out on the other end. The interfaces on those things today on the television side are typically SDI or HDSDI, ASI. Uh, there's a SMPTE 105 or something, I think, that's roughly equivalent to ASI. But um, the point, main points have to do with, for me, this would be a, a, a reference model to start to do make undertake a due diligence process on how do I create a equivalent in what's going to be this new world of dealing with live IP production. But you get you're going to get service from a local exchange carrier or other sources of uh, dark fiber. Um, and by the way, I've I've included when you get these charts, if you want them, you're going to find a lot of links in here. Um, and examples, so far as the equipment is concerned, is in this fine print category that I mentioned before. Um, so I don't want somebody coming back and saying, well, you said blah, 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 and therefore I'm holding you responsible for my mistake or my lack of due diligence. This is an example of the second or the later version and the implementation that I remember seeing first of this had to do with DirecTV when they um, inaugurated their local station, local market coverage as they call it. So you, if you had DirecTV service, you could see your local station. Before that, you always had to either disconnect the DirecTV box and reconnect an antenna or reconnect the cable system to get local channels. But what they did was go to each local TV station and put in a, a DS3 access facility, connect that to a inner exchange carrier DS3 and transport it all the way to Colorado or Los Angeles or wherever and put it on an uplink. And that became the local station uh, service for uh, anyone who had direct TV service. So the network side interface was an E3 or DS3, OC3 or in some cases, maybe an STM-1. And there are today examples, and one you can get from Everett's, is, I think they call it their 7890 uh, series. And if anybody remembers, the, the first impl implementation of these things was basically a Nortel DV-45. I was in a meeting in, uh, oh, back when I was at MCI, uh, where Mike Sherlock was addressing a group of people and he described a ring for the 1996 Olympics between Atlanta and New York. And he said that uh, allowed us to bring all this content back and edit it in New York instead of editing, editing it on the site in Atlanta. And he said the primary reason for that was to reduce the legal fees that they had to spend for lawyers to keep the editors out of jail and make sure they showed up in the morning for work. So um, an unchannelized local loop, uh, which is this entity here to the inner exchange carrier, and then at the egress point on the other end, a uh, reproduction of that. Kind of keep this model in mind as we start to talk about some of this Metro Ethernet service. 
the most recent changes in these devices, by the way, are the ability to offer uh, bi-directional uh, connections as, as well as uh, multiple interfaces on this. I've got a, uh, another block diagram of a network interface device in a minute that will help clear up some of this. So if we start to think about how do we do this in the future, um, the Metro Ethernet network services come to mind. Metro Ethernet is basically a result of the Metro Ethernet forum that was organized. It's a special interest group in the 2000-2001 oh, period and it's a group of equipment manufacturers and uh, service providers and a few users that got together and said, how can we take the basic LAN technology that's under our desk and adopt that and then adapt it to the carrier, make it carrier friendly? There are needs that have to do with uh, backup, redundancy, uh, hot pluggable stuff as they call it, multiple power supplies and things of that nature that the carriers have as basic requirements that most don't exist in, in LAN operations. There are two versions of Metro Ethernet services. Metro Ethernet or MEF 1.0 uh, has been around for about four or five years. And by this, I mean, if you go to the Metro Ethernet forum site, you'll find all kinds of specifications and definitions for what this stuff amounts to. And Metro Ethernet 1 covered a single network uh, operator and Metro Ethernet 2 enables connections between network operators or across multiple networks. So you can, chain, you can today chain together or have a service provider chain together with additional networks. There's also a version that covers something called an Ethernet exchange, uh, which is the old um, carrier hotel model where carriers would, carriers would all meet and exchange traffic in a a physical building, uh, but the Metro Ethernet Forum 2 enables multiple network uh, operators. Or the other approach you can take to something like this is go to one of the media network services, and, and I've got some examples in a minute, that will provide a, a form of what I call a cradle to grave or end to end soup to nuts solution, quote unquote. I don't like that word, um, but it's that's what's used out there in some cases over and over and over again. We're all um, uh, s solution hounds. Do I need to share this? No, uh, just want to pause you for a second and, and let you know that lunch is served. And if you guys want to start one, you know, queuing up over there, I think it's fine if you just continue. Just continue, lunch, and if we have quite get fine, uh, Ron, in case we want to do Ron questions. Ron, get on the questions because you know yeah. I know how long your presentation is, and there's a lot more slides ahead. And, uh, okay. We, we got Mark Shubin coming up in an hour. And, uh, okay. So, uh, what is a network interface device? It's basically a multifunction piece of equipment that uh, facilitates interface between a television system and a communications network. That's my definition of it anyway. There are two types of, it, of devices. There are those that uh, deal with uh, content on the TV interface side, and then there's data or IT only uh, devices. I'm going to talk a little bit about both. The so-called, that I've labeled type A, that has audio, video, signal interfaces to it, typically SMPTE 259 or 292 or AE um, 67 or whatever other um, AES society and label you have. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, the, the type B that most of the IT people um, always have, which is, uh, has pretty much is, uh, just Ethernet interface on, on the access side of it. Big issues that you really should think through or that I would want to think through is, do I want to turn my um, television operations for his uh, links over to a service provider, even one that I've trusted for years. And the issues have to do with how much do they know about television operations. And you'll find very few telephone company people or network service provider people that know very much about television operations as, as we know it. 
another thing is to make sure that you define the service demarcation points because that is definition should be put into a uh, service agreement as a uh, point where you want to measure and and figure out how you assess the performance of this uh, service provider. A block diagram of what this looks like, particularly a, a, a media type uh, machine has compression and decompression in it with SDI type interfaces. There are, are ways you earlier heard uh, somebody talk about, um, it was Matthew, about this, uh, his pipe across the ocean where you've got a, an Ethernet LAN extension from one location to another location that just becomes another uh, point on your um, local area network that workstations and other devices are connected to. Then there may be requirements for the classical TDM, either a T1 or an E3 or a DS3. You may have something that is a DVB-ASI interface or this a AS3 audio. On the, on the network or the line side, you've got this IP MPLS uh, virtual private line world that has been talked about. There's a carrier ethernet interface and uh, maybe a Sonnet or S SDH interface or just simple dark fiber. Most of these devices, and I'll have some examples in a minute, have all of these line side interfaces. This is what the carrier is gonna be interested in knowing what do they have, what do they have to meet you on what kind of interface. So as I said earlier, basically interfaces a media facility to a content transport network and the kinds of functions that you have to uh, make sure you can accommodate have to do with a variety of line and trunk side interfaces um, how to interwork and interoperate uh, with carrier networks and, and other network interface devices across the network. You've seen these examples of where uh, equipment manufacturers have uh, released product information on um, so-called interoperability and, and when you get to the bottom of it, what they're saying is my JPEG 2000 can be understood and decoded by their JPEG 2000. And other than just basic connectivity, that's what um, this kind of uh, thing you'll see out there. Hey, Fred. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, because of the way this, the schedule for the rest of the day is going, I think we're going to have to go on to the Q&A portion. And um, Ron will come on up and join you. I think why don't you guys start posing those questions. Uh, everyone will have the, uh, your paper available for, oh, okay. and the slideshow, and we'll figure out other ways to... We maybe can get back to this later individually, okay. but uh, we just got a little bit too much going on. Um, you know, that follows this, and uh, to be fair to everyone who wants to get lunch and so forth, and fair to you, of course, to get everyone's okay. full time and attention. So. Do you want to facilitate questions? Uh, sure. Well, I could start. Does anyone out there individually have any questions? Because uh, I don't want to, you know, this is sort of straight into my wheelhouse on MPLS, so I, I didn't want to focus it too much that way. But how about. Uh, I guess one of the obvious questions is is uh, reliability, and uh, I know Bob Pechtelite has just walked away. We've had this conversation for years, but anyone want to, you know, are, uh, other than large networks, any smaller stations or news uh, interested in uh, considering wide area networks and alternative alternatives to TV one circuits? Any folks? It's we're getting fewer questions with fewer people, and. And, and some of the people with uh, eating at the same time. Compete with, you guys? with lunch. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to compete with lunch. Well, maybe we should just all then. Uh... So how, I'm, I'm curious, when you, when you create these long networks and then you have issues with so many different components in play here, how do you determine whether it's the network's fault, you know, or the service provider, and especially when you're when you're negotiating multiple networks, maybe to do handoffs along the way, how how do you really ascertain where the fault really occurred, and also how do you make sure an SLA is actually being honored? Well, for both of you, I mean, um, you may have more experience with the SLA side. 
Ron, but I'm, I'm curious. Go ahead. I'm, I'll probably have to ask him to repeat his question. Well, well most of the S if, if you look at the MPLS uh, tier one service providers, like you, like Fritz said, they all have their standard vendor specific SLAs. There's a new set of SLAs you pointed out to me the other day came out of the EBU that's going to be broadcast oriented to, so you have something to negotiate with. So it really boils down to how big your network is, how much negotiating power you have uh, to be able to negotiate terms in your favor. But at the end of the day, um, it's really all about engineered reliability. We've lived for years with satellite uh, rain fades, sun outages, and we've learned how to build around those. In a case like this here, you've got networks that are in place. They're being used. They're, they're originally for telco grade, becoming increasingly more reliable for our kinds of applications, and you really have to sort of figure out how you want to use it. Well, we, well, my approach has been to put in belts and suspenders. The network uh, provider provides their own metrics in their SLA, but if you really look at it, it's if you have an outage, we'll give you 5% of your monthly charge back. That's not good enough. So how much teeth do you want to put in that? So at the end of the day, we put, uh, you put test equipment around there. People like Fluke inline monitoring, so you can look at packet traffic going in and out. There's a lot of commercial products out there like solar winds that give you metrics. Uh, on top of that, you take products like um, uh, Ineo Quests, uh, probes that can monitor down to the packet level, detect uh, closed caption dropouts, audio dropouts, uh, fade to blacks, QOE uh, testing, or Sendcore's video bridge product is another excellent one. They do, all, they do multicast joins and monitoring the quality down to the packet level. That gives you, if you've got your metrics, that gives you something to negotiate with your, your vendor on. But all boils down to what contract you negotiate. Did that answer the question, Peter? Is that, that the kind of thing you're looking at? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You have that, to engineer that, it. That's where you right. put the satellite yeah. on top for fail soft right. modes and uh, negotiate with the vendor and you track your own metrics. Okay. Um, we're Fred we're had, running so. pretty far behind schedule here, so we're actually going to try to catch up, which means Mark Schubin is going to come in and start his presentation at 1.50, which is 10 minutes from now, and we're going to eat lunch during Mark's presentation. So I apologize to Mark for having people eat during his presentation, but I don't want to keep you all here till 8 o'clock tonight either, or the hotel may kick us out anyway. So <laughs> thank you. There's a lot of important information. Thank you very much. Um, and